Bible? Hallelujah. Can I open your Bible, Pastor David? Hallelujah. I'm going to say it again. I was glad when they said, let's go into the house of the Lord. I was ready. I needed it. I need the Lord. But I'll tell you this. He's welcome in my home. For me and my house will serve the Lord. Hallelujah. For hallelujah. And I got a little scripture here that I want to talk about. See, if you don't know the word of God, you could get lied to. Can, can I be real? If you don't know the word of God, somebody could lie to you. You'd be like, amen, amen, amen. I'm here to preach the truth to you today. I'm here to preach the truth. See, I am a man, and if I tell you my theories and I tell you my opinions, Brother Glenn, I could lie to you. You remember when Jacob goes to Isaac and he lied to him? But then when he got a hold, the angel got a hold of him and he said, what's your name? He can't lie to the spirit. He said, hey, Jacob, you ain't going to lie to the spirit. Let me tell you something. What comes out of the word of God is truth. Nothing but truth. There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This guy was a, a top dog. He was a top dog that's supposed to know the word of God. Or at least the five first books of the Old Testament, right? Amen. He's supposed to know. Amen. And Jesus speaks to him right here. Amen. He said, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that do us except God be with him. And Jesus answered him and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I mean business. I mean business. Truly, barely, barely. What I'm about to say to you, I mean it, and I mean it, and I mean it. Barely, barely. Truly, truly. I say to you, except the man be born again. you got to be born again. See, I could be sitting here, and if you didn't know the word of God, you're going to be like Nicodemus and be like, how can a man of my age be born again from my mother's womb? No, hold on. As though there is... Either though there's a... A fleshly life or a fleshly death and a spiritual death. There's spiritual life too. There's a fleshly life and a spiritual life. But I say unto you, except the man be born again, he cannot, cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again. You have to be saved before you see the kingdom of God and its glory. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? This is a question that somebody that don't know the New Testament right now if you don't know the word of God and I said you've got to be born again and you don't know Jesus, you're going to ask me the same thing. How can a man be born again? Man, I'm just walking back and forth. I'm, my spirit. I needed God. I needed God last night. I needed God today. My spirit got hurt. My spirit got twisted. My spirit got sick because he said either you're hot or you're cold. But in the middle, I spew you out of my mouth. I need some hot Christians in this place today. I need somebody that's on fire here today. I need somebody... Hey, let me tell you, if you're not born again and you're not saved and I'm not saved and I'm trying to lead you, it says the blind leading the blind. You ain't going to see the kingdom if you are a blind man. 
Jimmy, you ain't going to see the kingdom if you're blind. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. I'm going to warn you right now. There's going to be people that's going to come to you with lies, with a twisted doctrine, with a twisted word from God. And if you don't know that word, you'll end up believing it. There's a point in time I was watching TV and I watch a man on TV, and he said, if you give a $1,000 seed and you buy this water, I'll send it to you. I thought about it. How can I make this money? How can I make this money? What God did on the cross was free. It didn't cost me anything for the salvation that God gave to me. When they ask you to pay for something, I'm here to tell you, it's a lie. Where's it at? Here, we'll just bless this real quick and sell it for a grand. It's a lie. It's a lie. Lest a man be born again of water in the spirit, he cannot, cannot enter the kingdom of God. I didn't come here to preach to you today, but I come to give you truth from the word of God. I come to give you truth of what was wrote in the scriptures. Not only was it wrote, but it's in red letters. Jesus spoke it. Jesus. Lest a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3, if you're wondering. I need some hot Christians in here today. Amen. We're about to, right now, if you're in a battle, if you're ready for war, you got weapons of warfare. Prayer, praise, and the word of God. We're about to go into prayer. We're about to go into praise. The man of God's going to give you the word of God. If you're going through a battle, you're in the right place right now. We're in a hospital for the sick, Pastor David. We're in a hospital for the sick. I came in here because I needed to be healed. I needed to be cleaned. I don't know if I spoke it last week or not, but there was a time back in the old days, we I think we spoke about it, that if you had leprosy, if you were sick, you had to tell them, unclean, unclean, unclean. I'm unclean. It's unclean. There was a time I stood before God, unclean, unclean. I need to be cleaned up. I need to know the truth. And thank God for discernment. Because my discernment kicked in and God said, John 3, 3, read it. Well, I've read it. No, read it again. For a man be born again. And if he's not, he cannot see the kingdom. He cannot see the kingdom of God. There's, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. If it was not so, I would not have told you so. Let me, I got one more thing, and we're going to get going with prayer because I know the man of God's got word. And I got word right here. I told Miss Ann earlier today, and the spirit fell out there. If you're living in the world and you're living for Satan, he don't even know who you are. The people in Boston were hell Satan. Did you see it? She was ripping the Bible up. Hell Satan. Hell Satan. But the seven sons of Sceva, he says, I know who Paul is. I know who Jesus is. But, but who are you? The Satan don't even know who you are if you're living for him. He says, I don't even know who you are. I know who's against me, but I don't even care who's for me. I could care less. I know Paul. I know Jesus. But who are you? He don't even know you. Amen. He don't even care about you. Amen. But Jesus says, I know my sheep. He says, I know my sheep. Hallelujah. Amen. I know my sheep. Amen. Can I tell you, he says, I know my sheep. But, but I asked somebody the other day if they knew Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. Yeah, I know Jesus. Smo smoking marijuana and drinking beer and then God says depart from me because I don't know you 
It's not the point if you knew him or not. He says, I don't know you. If, if you're really living for the, the, the Lord, he's going to know who you are. Amen. He says, I know my sheep. I know Paul and I know Jesus, but who are you? I know there's prayers in the house today. And if there's anybody in here lost, I am not the shepherd of this church, Pastor David Hutzel, one of the greatest men I know, who I am privileged, who I am blessed to serve under. One of the greatest men I know is the shepherd here. But if you're lost here today, and you don't know Jesus, he will change your life. He will change your world. You're looking at a drug addict, drug dealing, beat down, hating everybody, hating on everybody, can't stand nobody. And if you hated me and you went home and you hated me, I had you thinking about me all night. I had you in my grips. Amen. Can I be real with you? I wanted you to hate me. I'd have you thinking about me all week long. I'd have you plotting against me. I wanted you to hate me. But when the love of Christ came down and touched me, there's people I still see today that I got to walk up to and ask for forgiveness from them. When I see them in the mall, I see them in the store. You forgive me for who I was because I'm born again. I'm a new man. I'm born again. Now, I know there's prayers in this place. I know there's praise reports and there's prayers in this place. Hallelujah. We're going to get to them. But if you're lost, if you're blind and you can't see, if you need Jesus, if you need, if you need, to, you need to be fixed, if you need to be fixed, I know a mechanic. You pull up. You just pull. You pulled up in the right garage today. <laughs> you pulled up in the right garage today because I know a man. Amen. I'm not a healer, but I know one. Man, <laughs> I'm not a healer, but I know one. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you. Did you? Did I? The, the picture I brought in last week of the soldier that hit his knees to Jesus' feet. There's somebody in here right now that needs to just let go. Here's the altar. You need to let go. And you need to let God. Because I'm telling you right now, and I'm done. I had my sister come to me when I didn't see her for five years, come to me crying. And she said, Kitty, I looked in the newspapers every day to see if you was dead. I looked in the newspapers, in the obituary, every day to see if you were a dead man. Every day I looked. I said, I wasn't dead. I was lost. But now I'm found. And I, hey, there, there's times I come in here and I need my oil changed, Brother Glenn. They sometimes I got to change the brake pads when I come up in here. They sometimes... They, uh, there's sometimes when I come in here bawling my eyes out and I need to get my windshield wipers changed. We got to let go, man. We got to let go. This world has nothing for you, I promise. I know there's prayers and, and I'm, we're going to get to you last because I know what you got going on, okay? We're going to get to the prayers, Larry, get to you. Hallelujah. There's prayers in the place. Raise your hand. Miss Ann? Family. family. Mike, Mike Trimble. Pastor Floyd. Yeah. Pastor Floyd passed away too. I'm coming around to you. Brother. It's a Floyd Lambert, ain't it? Hallelujah. 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 Ma'am, God is a mender. God mends. God's a restorator. He mends things back together. God brings things back together. Am I wrong, Miss Judy? Mandy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
have an operation, Ken? I love you. You did that. I love you so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister. Yes. And first of all, I do want to give the praise to the Lord. One of the girls that didn't know Christ last year. Amen. Is now going to church and is getting baptized. Hallelujah. We need more, a lot more oh, prayers. Oh, yeah. Two girls in front of me were talking about Satanism. And I really, really ask the Lord for a cease. Pray for the girls. Will. I will. Hallelujah. He does. Thank God for that little girl that knows Jesus, though. For one, to turn around back to the kingdom. The kingdom's rejoicing. Brother. Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you, if you wouldn't, you wouldn't there the other night, I said something and I'll be done. We need more Naomi's, Miss Donna. We need somebody for the young Ruth's to take a hold of. Where's the women? Where, I'm saying, where's the women and men at? Where's the Pauls to the Timothys? Where's the Naomi's to the Ruths? Where's the older women that's going to let a young woman cling on to her? And where's the older men, gentlemen, me? Where are we at to let the young men cling on to us? We can't let this generation keep going the way that it's going. We can't. They need somebody to cling on to. We got to show them Jesus. We got to show them Jesus. I asked for a moment. I asked Pastor David if I had a moment, could have a moment, not for me, but for my Lord. What better way to start a prayer worship service than with praise? For he inhabits our praises. And I wanted to bring not one but praise God to praise reports. I have asked this church and all the other church organizations I work with to pray for my aunt in North Carolina, my mother's sister. We raised the money and was able to get her there because they basically sent her home to die. I wanted her to, my mother to be able to see her sister for the first time in six years. And my son then was going to take her and take my miracle grandson that she had never even met. Praise God, I got the report. They made it safely. And my aunt, that praise God, thank y'all for all your prayers, is up and running around, moving around even better than my mother is. <laughs> Secondly, as many of you know, Jean's daughter-in-law's brother had a heart attack on the couch in our house. Day before yesterday, they told his sister, he's brain dead. You need to prepare for pulling the plug, you're going to have to make the decision within the next couple of days. We finally got the test for us to go see him and pray for him. Yesterday, walked in the room. He was laying there on life support. Spoke to him. Jamie, it's Gene and Preacher Larry. I know you can hear me in there because I've been there too many times. You said you wanted to get your heart right with God and start going to church and get away from all this. Brother, the Lord has given you another chance. Do you want us to anoint you and help pray with you? He opened his eyes real big and just started squalling like a baby. That ain't brain dead. Then Edie went, then Edie went in and saw him when he heard her voice. Opened both eyes and looked straight at her and started squalling. I told him, I'm still believing in the miracle. I'm a living, living testimony of the miracle that he can do. He brought me back from the dead three times. And Jimmy, if you will accept him, uh, Jane, 
If you will accept him as your Lord and Savior and confess your sins, he'll forgive you and then allow him to use you. He can use you to bring all those others away from all that evil that's going on, and you can help to lead them to the Lord as well. And I'm standing on my Job-like faith that that's what my Lord is going to do. And want to thank y'all for your prayers, but most of all, thank you, sweet Jesus, for giving him another chance and for using us in the process. Praise God for all your blessings. And you all need to pray for one another, for this church, for the heaven-sent homes, and all of you remember what it says in God's word. For whatever you do unto the least of these, you do also unto me. Lift each other up in prayer, just like you would Jesus Christ. Don't talk about each other. Lift each other up. What can I do to help you, and how can I pray for you? In Jesus' holy name, thank you. Praise your name, sweet Jesus. Yeah. Prayer cloth. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray. You know how to do it. We're going to raise our heads and we're going to lift our hands. Because Matthew looked down in shame when he prayed out to God. We're going to look up to the heavens and raise our hands. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we love you and thank you here today. You've heard the prayers. You heard about the young lady that needs prayer. You heard about the prayers for the family. You heard about the kids on the bus. One that got saved. Hallelujah. But there's more, Heavenly Father, of this generation that needs to be touched by you. Father, you've heard about the surgeries. You've heard the prayers for your children. And Father, Father, I ask right now for prayer for my family. I ask you to cover our pastor in the name of Jesus and let the word today come out. Be swift and true. Hallelujah. Touch our pastor. Our pastor needs prayers. Hallelujah. We ask you to open the gates of heaven and pour out a blessing upon this place that we can't contain up in here. Heavenly Father, you said lest one be born again, he can't enter the kingdom of God. And Father God, if there's one here right now. I'm asking you to knock on their hearts. I'm asking you to knock on their hearts that these altars are always open, that they can come and hit their knees and hang everything on the cross and at your feet. Father, we love you and thank you for who you are. In your blessed and bold name I praise. Amen and amen. Thank you, Jesus. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. He is the Prince of Peace, bright morning star, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. I can't stop praising his name. I can't stop praising his name. Can't stop praising his name of oh, Jesus. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Prince of Peace, bright morning star, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Can't stop, 
praise in his name. Can't stop praise in his name. Can't stop praise in his name of Jesus. Can't stop praise in his name. Can't stop praise in his name. Can't stop praise in his name of Jesus. Praising his name, can't stop. Praising his name, can't stop. Praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop. Praising his name, can't stop. Praising his name, can't stop. Praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop praising his name. Can't stop praising his name. Can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Can't stop praising his name. Can't stop praising his name. Can't stop praising the name of Jesus. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise your name no matter what comes. Tell me, is he good? Is he good? Tell me, is he God? He is God. He is good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be Without your mercy So I'll keep praising your name At the top of my lungs I can't count I can't count Times I've called your name some broken night. You show up and lift me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you could ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be Without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs You see your love for me goes on Your mercy never stops so why would I assume that you'd be someone that you're not? Like the sun in the morning, I know that you keep coming around. There ain't no way you'd ever let me down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter who. Cause I know where I'd be Without your mercy So I'll keep praising your name At the top of my lungs Praise him Praise him in the morning Praise him in the noontime Praise him when the sun goes down Love him Love him in the morning Love him in the noontime Love him when the sun goes down Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Praising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'd be Without your mercy So I'll keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Love him 
Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praise in your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I'd be. Without your mercy So I'll keep praising your name At the top of my lungs Love him one more time Love him in the morning Love him in the noontime Love him when the sun goes down Jesus Jesus in the morning Jesus in the noontime Jesus when the sun goes down I can see the spirit moving in this place and people starting to smile and, you know, we're just getting these old feelings out of here and I don't know what kind of week y'all had last week. It don't matter right now. It's behind us. It's behind us. To cover it in the blood of Jesus. Long, long time ago, lived a man named Job. God said he was perfect, don't you know? Satan said if I take it out, it won't be long, his bed will fall. God said, all right, but don't take his life. I need a job like me. The kind that'll get you through The kind you can cling to When you got nothing else And when the world comes crashing down And no hope can be found You gotta turn it all around With a job like faith Hallelujah Neighbor said he's had enough of what this world has done. No faith in the flag or the father's son. The doctor says she don't have long and fears all hope is gone. Who raised my babies when I'm gone? I need a job like this. The kind that'll get you through Lord, the kind you cling to When you got nothing else And when the world comes crashing down And no hope can be found You gotta turn it all around With a job like faith What by faith not say Stand up tall with all your might You'll make it through another day I need a job like faith The kind that'll get you through Lord, the kind you cling to When you got nothing else And when the world comes crashing down no hope can be found You gotta turn it all around With a job like this I need a job like this The kind that'll get you through Lord, the kind you can cling to When you got nothing else And when the world comes crashing down no hope can be found You gotta turn it all around With a job like me I need a job like me We all need a job like me, hallelujah
Are y'all blessed today? Thank you. You're, you're all uh, up and dancing and singing for Jesus. Hallelujah. I want to say something real quick about this song. It says, and his train fills the temple. Do you know what that means? When one, when one group of people will fight another group of people, the king of the one that won got, got the train. Okay. God's train fills the temple. He's got all the nations. He's got all of them. And this is just a little song that give you a little preempt of what's going on, but it's a mighty song. I just ask y'all to stand if you can and worship with us. I see the Lord and his train fills the temple. I see the Lord and he is high and lifted up. I see the Lord and his strength fills the temple. the Lord and he is high and lifted up and the angels cry holy holy is the Lord and the angels See the Lord and his eyes are flaming like fire. I see the Lord and his hair is white as snow. I see the Lord and his eyes are flaming like fire. I see the Lord and his hair is white as snow. And the angels cry, if they cry, holy, holy is the Lord. And the angels cry, and they cry, holy, holy is the Lord. And the angels came to me and pressed the cold to my lips. Now my shame is gone and my sin, my sin has been forgiven. And I cry, and I cry, holy, holy is the Lord. Yes, I cry, yes, I cry, oh, holy, holy is the Lord. Temple is filled with the glory of God. Ah. 
Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I wonder if anybody knows how relevant the Word of God is. Huh? I mean, how important is the pursuit of God's Word? I mean, how, how can you know God and not know his word? He's the word made flesh. John 1 says he's the word made flesh and dwelt among us. When did he quit dwelling among us? Huh? When did the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ quit dwelling among us? Huh? He never left us. We left him. We left him because we think he's not relevant to our lives today because we can work it all out ourselves. Huh? Well, how important is your salvation? How important is it that you know Jesus Christ in, a, in his risen presence? I mean, he was crucified. I mean, that's the theme of today's message is crucified crucified 
Jesus was crucified, one of the cruelest manners of death ever known to man. The Greeks put it in place. The Romans uh, worked on what the Greeks put in place, and crucifixion became a shame to whosoever was crucified. The Bible says, uh, shamed, is, uh, shamed or cursed is the man that hangs on a tree. That's what the word says, that uh, it's a shame to be hung on a tree. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't think you understand. When Jesus was hung on the cross, he was hang, hung there naked. Huh? He might have had a loincloth on, but not likely because the Roman crucifixion wanted to shame that person that was being crucified. He wanted to, the, the Roman soldiers perfected it. They wanted to see how gruesome and how painful, painful, painful crucifixion could be. That's what the Roman soldiers perfected in, in the day that uh, Jesus walked this earth. In the flesh. I'm sure that Jesus in his 33 years walked uh, the Roman roads through Jerusalem and, uh, and, and the nor northern part of Israel, the Galilees. I'm sure that he walked through there many times and saw people hanging on crosses. Huh? Amen. Can't get it. There you go, Edith. Amen. Huh? Amen. Glory. Shame. It was a, a shameful thing. It was so shameful that, that, that they hung people naked in front of the whole world to see. Not only was it painful, suffering, and, and, and disgusting, not only was those things involved with crucifixion, it was shameful. I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. You know, there's a purpose for this message today. It was so important to the Jews that, that, that they uh, observed the appointments that God set for them. It was so important to the Jews that, that, that they observed the details of what God gave Moses to write down in the book of Leviticus. It's important. I mean, God delivered them out of, out of all their arguing with, and all of their pride, the stiff-neckedness of the Jews when they were in captivity. Come on now, we're there too. Stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. No way to convince everybody that this is the road to death. I mean, this road that we walk on from the time we were born has got a destination. That destination is death. That destination is separation from God. That's what the, what the word death means in Greek. Separation from God. And here we are separated from God because we don't think the Bible's relevant. We don't think it's important enough to, that we could we, we would sit down and give it any any of our time. I mean, that's where we're at, church. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Crucifixion. You know, people think that the Bible's boring. Or it don't make any sense. I can't understand it. Oh, they've told me all my life, don't open up the book of Revelations. You can't understand it. It's pictures and types of shells and metaphors and everything, but it's relevant. 
Every single thing in the Bible, every sentence, every word in the Bible is so important to our existence. That I mean, the, the, the path that the Bible lays out is not necessarily to the path of death, but it's the path to eternal life. Amen. We look at the world as it's all falling apart, but you ought to turn, turn the page over and say that this is the plan of God. I try to tell people that, that it, isn't a, it isn't a situation of, of, of what time it is or, where, I mean, where, where you're at in your studies or what you understand about the Bible. It's a time issue. Amen. In the fullness of time, the Scripture says, Christ came into the world. Yeah. Yep. He wasn't late. Nope. He wasn't early. No. He was right on time. Everything in the Bible has preference to God's timing. In, in I think it's in uh, uh, Psalms 118, when, when, about verse 30, somewhere in there, it says, "And they bound him, uh, bound the sacrifice to to the to the altar, the altar, and and, and you know, at the same time, the Levit Levitical priesthood was coming up from Jericho, and they had gotten there at 9 o'clock in the morning. They did the morning sacrifice. These psalms, or Psalms 118, is a song that they sing from 113, Psalms 113, up to past 119, 20. It was songs that, that was written for the priests to sing as they did their duties in the, in the temple, they were fulfilling the times that, that God had laid out in Leviticus. They were fulfilling them. I mean, they, they realized that Passover meant that God passed over them, that they wouldn't die. You know, Hebrew, the word Hebrew means those that pass over. That's what the word uh, uh, Jew means. Jew means uh, those that pass over. You want to be one of those that pass over? I mean, is it important to you? Let me ask you a question. Let me put it this way. Is it important to you that you don't go to hell? Come on. Is it important to you that you get this thing right? It is important to you to understand that the voice of God speaks to you all the time. You know, no wonder Jesus said, those that have an ear to hear, let them hear what thus saith the Lord. Come on, let them hear what thus saith the Lord. It's relevant. What Everything that goes into into the Word of God, everything that comes out of the anointed preaching or an anointed Bible study, you know, God has an anointing for every situation. Uh, even uh, in death, we see, we go to funerals and say, well, God has grace to cover the circumstance. God has grace. Some people have gotten saved. There's one guy talking about, uh, he's praying for about six individuals, and he prayed for them daily. Daily, he prayed for them to get saved and prayed for them to get saved. Three of them got saved, and his life went on, and he continued to pray for them. And just as he went to his deathbed, he was still praying for them. And the three that hadn't received Christ before he got went on into eternity, they got saved the day of his funeral. Amen. Huh? Amen. God answers prayers. God answers the fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much in, in the sight of God. Amen. Prayer works. Prayer is the most important weapon that we have besides the Word of God. The Word of God's a, a sharper than a two-edged sword. And if you look at Revelation chapter 1, you understand that verse 9 through 12 describes Jesus when he appeared to John when he was giving him the book of Revelation and said he had a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. It cuts both directions. It cuts both directions because we need, we need a defender. We need a defender because if we don't have Christ in us and, and for us, then, then we're we're free game to the devil. Amen. I mean, he has the right. He has the right to do whatever he wants to to us if we're not in Christ. 
if you're not serving Christ and knowing Christ on a daily basis, you're, you're a victim to, to the enemy, the devil, and his, uh, his hordes of demons. I mean, hordes of demons. There's a bunch of them. They, they drown in the flood. The giants, the Nephilim that drowned in the flood, they didn't have bodies to do. They wander across the earth seeing who they can perfect, possess. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Crucifixion is most, the most cruel manner of death, especially in Jesus' day. Amen. Not only was it cruel and painful, it was shameful. It was shameful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity you give us to come together here today. We pray that your word would penetrate our hearts it, through our minds into our hearts that we might not leave here the same as we came. Lord, it's a glorious thing to, to, to be on your side, that we have a, a blessed hope that, that once death comes to our door, we can pass through because you passed over. Your blood's applied. Lord, we pray right now that your anointing would flow through this sanctuary into the hearts and minds of the people that are gathered here. We pray right now that you'd open their eyes. Open your eyes and look. Look. God's not doing something in the dark. I mean, it's the tendency that we have because, because, you know, it's just what we've been instructed, you know, to, to close our eyes and raise our hands. But, you know, uh, like Bob reminded me in the office there, God's not God's will. It's not in the Bible nowhere to close your eyes and raise your hands. We need to see what's going on. Huh? We need to see the plan of God at work. We need to walk in the power of God. God ain't walking around with his eyes closed. Amen? Amen. He's not. So why, did, why is nakedness so important to the crucifixion? Because Eve and Adam found themselves naked in Genesis 3, 7. Genesis 3, 7, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they, their eyes were opened, it says. And they saw, what did they see? They saw the shame of sin, the shame of disobedience, and all that relates to their nakedness. Now, if it, if it wasn't the shame and everything, why would it matter if they recognized they were both naked? Because the only thing that changed was they disobeyed God. So it's more than just being naked and their eyes being open. It was the shame of disobedience to God. And we fall short of it all the time. There's none, none worthy. It's in your notes, sir. I, 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 know, I, I know from experience. I'm not going to get all the way through them. So I thought today is important that you got the notes that the Lord gave me last night. Amen. You know, you see there uh, the, the penalty of sin, and it tells you who deserves to die. We all do. Because if you, if you miss the mark on one thing, you miss the mark on everything. Come on. So the grace of God is, is, is given to the faithful of God. That's why you must be born again. Born to the kingdom of God. Huh? Born into the kingdom of God. The, the kingdom of God... Jesus said to Pilate, said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my angels would show up right now. Huh? So here, here he's telling the, uh, Pilate and, and the Roman soldiers and the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, he's telling them that his kingdom is not of this world, but it's going to be of this world because he created this world for his purpose, for man to abide Amen. on the earth, but it's not going to be an earth that's fallen. It's going to be, a, 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 it's going to be an earth that's redeemed. You see, it's not, a, it's not a knowledge thing. It's a timing thing. You see, it's a timing thing because 
the Lord told me that this is the most urgent time that humanity's ever experienced. It's most urgent that you be a Berean. I mean, a Berean, when Paul preached Jesus res resurrected from the dead, it caught their attention. They'd never heard of anybody getting up after they'd been dead for three days. Huh? But then uh, Jesus gave them an example of, of him having power over life and death when he raised Lazarus from the dead. The same, ten, uh, the same period of 10 days before he was crucified. He showed them to, and it'd be fresh on their mind that even though Lazarus had been dead four days, he had power to raise him up. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, people think that God raised Jesus from the dead, but Jesus himself said, I have power to lay my life down, and I have power to raise it up. Amen. Hallelujah. And I have power to raise it up. You want power? Yes. You, want, you want newness of life? It comes in a form of born into the kingdom of God. Amen. Born into the knowledge that was given from creation on. I mean, Revelation 13, 8 says that he was crucified from the foundation of the world. Ain't that right, Earl? Amen. From the foundation of the world. So he done set it in order. He done made the plan. He done wrote it all out. You're included in the books that, that are written. You're included in them. You know, you ought to rejoice in the knowledge of Christ risen even more than the past generations because you understand that we're out of time. Amen. This is an urgent message. And so we're not going to have to endure this thing much longer. Nope. Floyd Lambert that passed away a couple of days ago, and, and he's entered into the reward that God had laid up for him for being a faithful minister of God. And, and so... Here he is, he's in the presence of God. And you know, the great thing about that is the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Woo! Yeah. Come on now. Amen. But we're not going to be far behind them if we're dead in this body and alive in Christ, born again. Amen. Born of the knowledge of God. The, what is the knowledge of God? That the blood of Jesus cleanses yeah. completely. <laughs> Go to Hebrews, you're at Hebrews 12, verse 2. Carol, read verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Okay, wait a minute. Now, Jesus is talking here in, in Hebrews. It should be read later because he's telling in, in verse 1 of Hebrews, he said, he said that we've got a cloud of witnesses. There's, a, there's a, a creation that we're not privy to until we enter into to our destination of eternity. But everybody, everybody that's ever been born is going to die. And then the judgment. See, they leave off the then the judgment because they don't want to be judged. I'll judge myself. Emma used to say whenever we was going to Walmart or something, we'd get out of the car in traffic, be going up and down through there. She had a little three or four-year-old, and, and hold my hand, honey. We're going to walk in. I want you to get run over. She'd pull her hand back and say, I'll hold my hand. Huh? She said, I'll hold my hand when she didn't realize that it was a precaution to sa keep her safe. So uh, that's what holding the hand of Jesus is. That's what letting the Holy Spirit have his, de have his de de dominion in our lives. We're not alive for ourselves. We're alive for Christ's sake. We're to be a witness to a lost and dying world that somebody might realize that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. Amen. It ain't your agenda. It ain't my agenda. It ain't no preacher's agenda. It's for you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Berean style. Last week I told you Bereans were those that, that, uh, that studied out the things that they heard to understand what was wisdom in, in God. You see, wisdom is a great thing, but 
knowledge is better than wisdom. I mean, I gave you on the second page of that paper, I gave you the studies of systematic theology. If you go to college to, to, to learn what the Word of God says and, and the history of the Word of God, you will, be, you will encounter a course that's about this thick of systematic theology. Systematic theology is, not, is only means the study of the gods, studies of religion, studies of religion, and these are the subjects that they study. All these, uh, all these topics here, you know, is in the book of, of systematic theology, but the last one. And the last one is very important to, to our knowledge that we're grafted in because the Jews were partially blinded. Huh? So here, the, the last subject there, uh, Israel, the Israelology is that God had a purpose for them. What's the last word there? It, it says, uh, Israel is God's instrument. Five, six of the Bible. God is, Israel is God's instrument that we can gauge God from. The Bible tells us in, in, that Jesus said in Matthew 24, it says that, that, that Jesus started talking and said, be not deceived several, about seven or eight times right in the beginning of Matthew chapter 24, be not deceived. If you go to Romans chapter 11, you understand that, that Paul said, don't be proud in yourself, you Gentile church, but God will restore the Jews in the last days. They'll be raised up because the, the, the seven years of tribulation, the seven years of the last judgment of God to bring the Jews back to right relationship to show him, to show us all that God has the power of life and death. Amen. Now here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says that he despised the shame. What shame? The same shame that Adam and Eve experienced when their eyes were open. You understand how that connects together with the Word of God? Isaiah 43, the first part of Isaiah 43, that first clause is uh, uh, that, you know, eyes being opened and the shame, shame of death. It's a shameful thing to die and not have Christ to raise you up again. He raised himself up, but we're to, we're to be raised up by Christ, the Holy Spirit in us. The Holy Spirit's given to us, but we're not the Holy Spirit. You know, uh, people get it in their mind, because I'm born again, now I'm a God. Huh? No, you're not a God. He's God. He's the only God. And, and so if, if you're, the Holy Spirit's in you, he's the Holy Spirit. He's God. Hallelujah. But I am, like I said at the tent ministry, I am proud. I am, I am so thankful. I'm so grateful that God showed mercy on me and came into my heart, and, and I'm allowed to host him even though I'm not worthy to host him. I'm not understanding enough to host him, but he's come into my heart, and he's changed me, and he wants to change you. He wants to change you. He wants to give you life and take away that death, that shame of death, that shame of disobedience or, or not believing the whole story of God. Amen. Go ahead and read verse uh, 2 there, Carol. Looking unto Jesus, the <coughs> author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The pen is still in the author's hand. That's what the, the, the Lord reminded me whenever I was sitting on the back pew in 1995 and, and I was listening to the praise, the worship, I was listening to the message on a Sunday night and all of a sudden I had an open vision of the Lord's hand holding the cross like a pencil. And the blood that ran down the cross and the word grace at the end of the cross, the pencil is the grace that the contract still stands. Amen. 
salvation signed in blood. Amen. So that contract is for, for all time. Here we understand there's going to be a tribulation period, and then there's going to be a millennial reign, and, and the scriptures bears out that those that are born during the millennial reign will have to make their own decisions again. And be judged. And so it's the same blood that covers our sins and changes us and cleanses us to be acceptable to God. I mean, we're acceptable to God because he said it's finished. You see, he was crucified. The most gruesome thing here in the Old Testament, you, you had Passover and Moses led the children of Israel out out of bondage and, and came to the Red Sea and they crossed the, the Red Sea uh, or the Sea of Reeds uh, on dry ground and they went to Mount Moriah and, and, and Mount Moriah was Pentecost and so uh, here the, the proposals made. The proposals made. The Jews agreed to the proposal. Moses went back up on the mountain and, and, and God's own finger writ, wrote down the agreement that they made to be un, in a unity uh, relationship with God. Amen. So that, that same principle applies to those that are born again in Christ. Amen. The type and shadow is Jacob and Jacob marrying Leah first. Deceived, I mean, they were deceived. Uh, Laban, Laban, the 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 father of Leah and Rachel, deceived Jacob because it wasn't that the he he gave Jacob the the answer when he said, "Why have you done this?" Said among us, it's not right to give the youngest before the oldest, huh? What, give them in what? Unity. Give them in unity. So here, uh, uh, Jacob accepted that because Laban said, work for me another seven years and I'll give you Rachel. So you have the, you have the type and shadow of a picture of the Gentiles marrying and then you have Leah having six sons and the seventh child was a girl. So you have the same principle of the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 played out there because it says the, the, the seven churches and the last one is a Laodicean church age which means feminine and weak. Women are more feminine than men. Women are weaker than men for the most part. I mean, they got stronger wills, but, <laughs> yeah. huh? Just ask Judy. She says, do, and I say, okay. <laughs> huh? That's the, that's the power of a woman. Huh? I mean, even in, in, the, in the way it turned out, God said to the woman that she'll be saved through childbearing. What's he talking about? He's talking about because through the woman's uh, DNA, there's going to become a Savior, Christ Jesus, in the lineage. Amen. I mean, God is precise and perfect because he knows what he's doing. Why wouldn't we want to know him in the power of his resurrection? Why do we want to stay in death and separation from God? Why do we think that the Word of God is outdated? Come on, ask some of these theologians, uh, ask some of these college professors, ask, ask some of these college students what, what they think about the outdated Bible. Huh? I'm carrying this microphone around because I was going to get Lysandra to pray us in, and she took off on me. She had the class to take, though. So I guess I can lay that down. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you getting anything out of this? Amen. Yep. Amen. Did you finish reading verse 2? Go to, go to Hebrews chapter 9. I don't know 
if you notice, but I, I can't stay in the direction that God gave me because he puts things that I need to say first, last. Most of the time, that's the way it works, that, uh, that, that he starts me in the middle of a thing. I mean, and I understand that's okay with me because he's the author and finisher. Huh? He knows what you need. You know, he, he called me to be a shepherd, but he's the ultimate shepherd. You know, it says that if you have not loved, then you have not, if you have not charity or love the same thing, then you, then you don't have anything. So if the message is not love, the message is love, church. The message has always been love. It's a love letter that God writes to the world that those that hear and read it and understand it and believe it might be saved. I said this story before. Uh, there was a, a great big auditorium, a big revival going on. It was in a college setting and everything. And so they had invited this uh, this this uh, this scholar. I mean, he was he was uh, he could quote the Bible verse by verse. He could do it randomly. He could speak the word of God. And he came into the auditorium, and and the, the subject matter was uh, was uh, Psalms 23. The subject matter was, uh, 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 Yea, though I walk through the valley of darkness, I shall fear no evil, for Thou art with me. It's the good shepherd. And so here he, he, he reads the, the, the Psalms 23. He reads it and, and expounds on Psalms 23 and everything. And, and then he gives an altar call and no one responded. Not one person in that whole auditorium responded at all to his message or his altar call. So here they asked an old preacher just an old country preacher, they asked him, he said, 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 we want you to speak. And so the same subject matter. So here the old, old uh, preacher, the old uh, experience, one that experienced the Word of God, got up in the pulpit and started reading uh, Psalms 23, and he read it with such elegance. And he wrote, read it with such passion, and he read it uh, with understanding that, that the, there's a table prepared before us in the presence of our enemy, but God dominates the table. Amen. Hallelujah. He, he's all-powerful. There's nothing has any power against him. Amen. So here the old preacher continued to read there, and he, he finished his sermon at, on the, the 23rd Psalm, and he said, he is our good shepherd. He is the shepherd of, of many pastures. He's the shepherd that, that cares for the sheep, and, and he's the shepherd that spends time with the sheep. He's the shepherd that, that, that loves the sheep. He's the shepherd that prepares the way for the sheep. And so he put, finishes preaching, and he gives the altar call, and the, and the whole altar area filled up with people. Amen. Same chapter, same message, just brought in a different manner and so here he's preaching and everything and and, and the crowd uh, re, ex, the crowd responds to the message and so when it's all over and everything it settled down and they'd all left a person came to that person that was studied and knew the word could quote it backwards and forwards came to him and said what was the difference and that old man, I mean, that, uh, that study professor that could read the scripture and everything, he told that person that asked him the question, he said, I know the scriptures. But that old preacher knows the shepherd. Uh, that, old, that old preacher knows the, knows the shepherd. Do you know him? Hallelujah. 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 
Gave you that second page there to show you that the, that the different studies of the Word of God and the different religions and history in particular uh, is laid out there. I printed out a paper on uh, numerology. You remember I handed it out, numerology. That's just one of the subjects there in that list. But, you know, if you read that list and you read the, the right side of it, it tells you what that study is. So numerology is the study of the Holy Spirit. You could spend a lifetime studying the Holy Spirit. You could spend a lifetime experiencing the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the power of God that moves in our life. He's the one that Jesus said is coming back to teach you. What thus saith the Lord? Creation's in that way, but Jesus Christ despised the shame, despised the nakedness, but counted the cost for salvation. Because what Adam and Eve done, and they found themselves naked and their eyes open, he had to turn around and pay the penalty for that disobedience. He had to pay the price because if he hadn't paid the price, nobody could be saved. He paid the price and he gave us the word of God. There's no, I mean, uh, in the New Testament it says every word uh, that's written in the word of God is inspired by God. Amen. You understand the relevance of the Bible? It declares itself. If you want to know the time we're in, go to Daniel chapter 9. The, verse, the last four verses of Daniel chapter 9 is the timing of, of our day that we live in. Uh, it says that Israel's going to sign a, a treaty with the, the Ten League Nation or the Antichrist system. And, and when they sign that, it's going to begin the tribulation period. We're watching these things play out right now. That's why this message is so urgent. He's worthy of your time. Amen. He's worthy of all that you are and all that you ever will be. Amen. Because there's nothing outside of him. If you don't have him, you have death. Death is separation from God. And another uh, definition is shame. Another definition is shame. I mean, here you, uh, I give you these notes and stuff, and you, you, you see, uh, if you start out down there at, at the front, let me find one. Hallelujah. Oh, it's all right. Jesus loves the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary had a little lamb. His name was Jesus. Huh? Everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Life is like Life like this, living life like this, people think this is all there are to it. Death by execution, crucifixion. Jesus' death was, was um, substantiary. That was, I had to break it up. It's probably not spelled right. Substantiary. It's substantial. It is life, life more abundantly. James chapter 2, verse 10, I put the theme of it. If you break any one law, you're guilty of all. Romans 6, 23 says that the wages of sin is death. Death means separation from God for eternity. This is, I mean, you don't understand. This is your only shot at it. That's right. There's no redo. There's no remake. 
How, how relevant does that make the story of Jesus Christ crucified and risen again? How relevant does it make it to you now to know that you don't have to do over? When you die, it's done. Then the judgment. Then who deserves to die? Romans 3.23 tells you that we all deserve to die. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says, John uh, says, if we say we are without sin, we lie. Right. Right. Hebrews 9, 27, go there. Go back to, to 9, 22. Okay. Nine, go to 9, 22. And almost all things are, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself. Now this is what, Je what the book, the writer of Hebrews is saying. Jesus has not entered into the sanctuary that the high priest takes the blood offering of lambs and goats and, and bullocks and stuff. He's not entered into that sanctuary. He's entered into the high and holy sanctuary Amen. in the spiritual realm. Moses was told to make the, the tabernacle in the wilderness he was told to make it after the pattern of what he saw in heaven. Amen. Made exactly like that. We think the cross is the first time, or crucifixion is the first time we see the cross. If you look at the tabernacle in the wilderness, all the furniture is shaped in a cross shape. All the tribes were shaped in a cross, in, in a cross shape. So the whole thing was about the cross to start with. Amen. The sting of death. Je, uh, Kenny's shirt. Oh, death, where's your sting? First Corinthians chapter uh, 15. Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is removed by the blood of Jesus if it's applied to your life. If not, crucifixion, the penalty of not accepting Christ's sacrifice applies to you. Like I said, Floyd Lambert down here will rise first. And then us that are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Go ahead, Carol. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into holy places every year, with holy places every year with blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Nobody wants to talk about judgment. Over the next page, we're going to skip down to there. I want to uh, divisions of theology, uh, study of divisions of theology, uh, uh, Bibli, Bibli, uh, Bibleology is the study of the Bible. Bibliology. Bibliology is the study of the Bible. Theology Ology proper is the attitude of God. Study the attitude of God. You know, out of all the things that you can study about God, the main thing of God is that he is love. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Uh, Christology is the study of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pneuma, pneuma, pneumology is the study of the Holy Spirit. We talked about that. Angelology is the study of angels, fallen and unfallen. Um, and... Anthropology, anthropology is the study of man. Uh, Scientology is the study of salvation. That's one you are study. Study of salvation. You know what it boils down to? The study of salvation is the study of Jesus Christ because he is salvation. That's what Jesus means is salvation. 
Eschatology is the study of the church. S, help me with that. S, S ecclesiology is the study of end times, end things. Ecclesiology is the church and S, chatology. Okay. End times, last Amen. things. Amen. All right. So here, here they understand that five, six of the Bible is, is, is pointed to Israelology. The, the Israel asked God's instrument. God's instrument, which God used the Jews, the Israelites, to bring forth the Christ through Mary, the virgin, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecies pointing to his appearing, his coming. What did he come for? For our salvation. Uh, this is a personal thing. Thank you. Amen. Listen to me. This is the most personal thing you'll ever confront. Jesus came for you. Let's all stand. Uh -huh. This is the most important subject you'll ever have. This is the most important thing you'll ever do. Jesus came for you. Now it's up to you. Will you accept him or reject him? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my sayings. If you love me, keep my sayings. How can you know what his sayings are unless you study to show yourself approved, what Paul told Timothy? Amen. How are you going to study? Read a book? How are you going to study? Read a book or live a book? This is alive. It requires life application. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. This message is timely because... This weekend is the second Passover. This weekend is the second Passover. In, in the wilderness, when they buried the dead, it made them unclean. So if they had to bury the dead at time of Passover, they couldn't, they couldn't participate in the Passover. So God told Moses, I'll give them another 30 days, and then we'll do another one for their benefit. That's how gracious God is. So here we are at a time no one thinks. You know what the word embassy, intimacy, intimacy means? No, it means intimate return. He could return at any minute. How did you say it? How did you say it? Intimacy, intimacy. Eminently, there you go, Jimmy. Eminently, he could turn eminently. He can do anything he wants to. But you know, I'm I'm kind of leaning toward the appointments of God for him returning in the cloud. Okay, so he left in the cloud. When did he leave in the cloud? If this is 30 days, this weekend is 30 days to the second Passover, then. Forty days is the day he ascended to the cloud. That right. So what? If he's in the cloud, you see him uh, uh, coming through the cloud in Revelation, in Revelation chapter five, yep. the coronation ceremony in heaven. That's right. So here we are, and the forty days. You know what day that falls on this year? The eighteenth of May. You count it up from Passover to the resurrection. If you count it up, then the May the 18th is the day he ascended into the cloud. 
You know why I don't think that he'll come at the Feast of Trumpets? Because that's all I've ever heard. He's coming back at the Feast of Trumpets. It says, no man knows the day or the hour. So is that a high watch day? Doesn't mean he's coming on the 40th day, May the 18th. But it means you better be looking. But imminent return means watch constantly. Watch constantly. So the question is, the question is, is he going to return when you hear that trumpet? Are you going to be ready to go? With every head bowed, every head bowed, you know, the Bible says that they bowed their knees. Bow their knees. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. It don't say close your eyes. It says bow your head, bow your knee, and look for his return. If Jesus' trumpet sounded today, would your eyes be open? If Jesus came today, Maybe the 18th. Today's the 7th. He's soon coming. He's soon coming. And this, this is for you to, to make the decision for yourself. I can't push you into it. I can't prompt you into it. I can just tell you that it's the most important decision you'll ever make. If there's anybody here that don't know Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin, right now is the time to straighten that out. You want to know him? Most important thing is that you want him to know you. Would you say to me in this congregation, because the first thing you have to do once you Accept the Christ is confess him. So there's no shame in confessing Jesus Christ because it's the beginning of your journey. Maybe you need to rededicate your life because you missed the mark. You know, that's what uh, a lot of people do in, in baptism. They've been, like me, been baptized seven or eight times because I felt like I needed to do my first works over again. Would anybody come forward today and say, I want to know Jesus Christ. I want the preparation of eternity to start working in my life. I want the Word of God to be effective and alive in me. I don't want to just know the Word of God. I want to know the author of the Word of God. Would you come? Would anybody step out and say, that's me. Jimmy's already in the altar. I mean, this is crucial. Okay. That's all I know to do. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to preach your word. I pray that you've made it be alive and effective. You love us and you came that we might have you. That we might... You might come and get us that whenever you come again in the cloud, a trumpet sounds, we'll meet you in the air. If we miss the rapture, we'll be, the, uh, be committed to you in the tribulation saint area before the wrath of God. We just pray for souls to be saved, ask you to intervene in all the lives that are here, that, that this word not just fall blank when we leave here. Would it be active and working in every life and every ear that heard the word of God today? We give you the glory for it because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love y'all. And Jesus loves you more. I hope that the message was understandable. Thank you. Amen.